with the cloud. All right, so uh, first off, business stuff today. As I say here, I've got the chat open. So if you're somebody who wants to respond but doesn't have, you're not in a place to use your microphone or you can't use it because it doesn't work or something, feel free to type in the chat. I've got another screen set up, so I will be looking. Um, so that's the first businessy point. Also, for those of you who are not here currently but are going to be uh, watching this live in the future, um, or I mean, watching it recorded in the future. Uh, hi, hi, future people. Um, those of you who are here right now, if you miss something or your internet cuts or you have to leave early, everything I say today is going to be posted to a YouTube channel. And I will be emailing you all out the link to that YouTube channel later this afternoon, as soon as this uploads and is ready to go. So if you have to drop out or anything, there it is. Um, Last thing, we do not have class on Friday. Again, that's why we're meeting today because of CUNY's stupid Tuesday is a Friday thing. Um, and if for some reason, uh, well, yeah, that's just the way it is. You don't have class Friday. You don't have to make up your Tuesday classes. They'll be figured out later in the semester. But we do not meet this Friday. Uh, so the next time you see me will be next Friday, which I guess is the, what is today? Dates are hard. The 11th, the 18th. The next time you see me is the 18th. So enjoy not seeing my face for a week and a half. Uh, you will be able to be free of cyber ethical thoughts for like nine days. All right. Any businessy questions at this point? Questions, comments, concerns, feelings, anything? All right. In that case, and I am recording, right? Yes. So I can erase this too. So we are going to jump into today's topic, which is written on the board. What is today's topic? Testing if you're all awake. Professional yeah. ethics. Professional ethics. Exactly. Thank you, Agnor. Thank you, Mohammed. Yeah, professional ethics. So we've talked about ethics a bunch. It's the study of morality. We don't need to go over that. We are instead going to be talking about the professional bit. And so what today's basic approach is going to be is we're going to start off by talking about what professional means and what professions are. Then we're going to talk about what professional ethics is. We're then going to talk about why professional ethics is a thing. Then we're going to talk about some particular issues that rise in the context of professional ethics. And then I'll say have a nice rest of your whatever today is Tuesday. Um, all right. So for starters, professional is an adjective that is the adjectival form of a noun, namely profession. So for starters, what is a profession? There are two things I'm asking here, either for definition or for examples. So who can give me either an example or a definite de definition of a profession? Anyone got any examples of professions or definitions for professions? Profession meaning like a career goal, like a doctor? Exactly. So it's tied in. So one is career and the other, we've got a great example of doctor. That is a great example of a profession and professions are definitely tied in with your career. So what are some other things? So it's not every the way we typically use profession, though, not everything that you might consider a career or a job would count as a profession. So things like doctors certainly do. So what are some other examples of things? If somebody says they're a professional, what does that generally mean they're talking about? Um, it, like professional, like it's like a, it's like a, damn, I don't know how to explain it. It's like a, a, a basis on how to like, you know, keep like, in order to keep things like, tight like maintain like a pharmacist or like a library like a librarian or something yeah there are these things where they're keeping things running and it takes a lot of work and practice exactly because of what Mohammed says it's tied in with expertise so expertise or the, the form of this is expert somebody who is a professional there's not just a career. It's a career in something where they are an expert in it. So for instance, a doctor or a pharmacist or a librarian, these are all people who have an expertise in a certain area. So what is a doctor an expert in? It's not just that 
they have a job. It's rather they have a job that they're an expert in what? What do doctors know really well? Health. Yeah, health and medicine, the human body, how to heal it. What do pharmacists know? Drugs, how to, what to prescribe for different things, how much to put in a certain dose, how many to go in the bottle, what sorts of medicines might interact with each other. Um, what are some other sorts of professions then? Uh, school safety, security guards. Yeah, secure, you can't, not just anybody is in a position to be a security guard. Lawyer yeah. is another good one. So you can see how many of these things, anyone want any more they want to throw up here? There's tons you can think of, but this is, this is enough to illustrate the general. Say that again. Uh, some people, some people do like um, streaming, video game streaming. Um, yeah, you could yeah. definitely say like a pro gamer or a pro streamer are professions. Not just, I mean, it starts off that you're not a professional in that, but by the time yeah. you're getting paid, you like, if you ever watch, how many of you out of curiosity watch Twitch? I certainly have. I, I, um, um, yeah, so, these people are really skilled at what they do, not just the video game, but the in terms of running something and being an entertainer at the same time. Yeah, it's really, it's tough to do. Like the, there's a reason that the best streamer, I hope you're watching something good, Ahana, uh, very good at what they do. Um, so yeah, these are the sorts of things. Another one, athletes and engineers are other good ones. Like LeBron clearly has some God-given talent, but the man also puts in a lot of effort. Like it takes a lot of, it's not like LeBron goes home and eats candy and drinks beer all day and then looks like the human like chiseled man he is. No, the man works at it. He perfects his craft. He knows how to do things correctly. That the, Like give me a basketball. Yeah, he spends a mil on his body a year. Yeah, the man has... And all professional athletes these days, the, the dieting, the weightlifting, the sleep schedules, the meditation, the yoga, all of that. And they know better than the average person what they need to do to be able to continue. Like I go out for a run and within a minute, things hurt. LeBron is older than I am. And yet the man could not look healthier. Engineers are another one. I and all types of engineers. I, no matter what I did, I would not be, if I were given a, a contract to build a bridge, my number one suggestion to you would be never ever go across my bridge because I do not know anything about bridges and it is guaranteed to fall and you will get hurt. By contrast, a structural engineer knows how to build a bridge that will not fall over. The Brooklyn Bridge, somebody very smart built that back in the 1800s and I mean, it's had to get some construction renovations, but generally speaking, the bridge is still there. Why? Because it wasn't just some schmuck like me making the bridge. It was someone with expertise whose career it was to make a bridge. So that's what we mean by a profession. A profession is someone who it is a career or a job, but it's a job that has expertise. And very often that's through training. Now, I think the case can be made that certain types of streamers um, and things like that, they didn't get ex like official training, but through hours and hours of practice and experiment, they are able to do things um, that I could never imagine doing. Like even the act of streaming, like to be able to engage with a chat and play a video game at the same time is itself somewhat difficult. Like I can't, if I'm playing a video game, nothing else in the world is happening right now. To multitask like that and be good at both of them is a real skill that you have to practice. So professionals are people with training, expertise, and it's their job. It's how they make their money is in this particular area. So with that in mind, why is it that we're going to be talking about professional ethics or professions in this class? What is an example of a profession? that ties in with this class. I, exactly, Tyler. So yeah, information technology is a type of profession, any sort of thing around IT. 
software engineer, a hardware engineer, somebody who's just in the IT department fixing issues with a company's um, servers or any sort of IT problems that come up, someone who works in cybersecurity. All of these are types of professionals. These are professions because not just anyone can do it. Human beings are not born able to speak Python or able to speak C++. You have to learn these things. And to get good at them, you need a lot of training. So this is why we're bringing up professions in this context, because one of the growing major types of professions today are IT professionals, information technology professionals. And so what we're going to be doing today is talking about, given that IT is a type of profession, what are some of the ethical issues or some of the reasons that IT professions or as a profession, IT brings up certain types of ethical questions or ethical issues or things just to think about in the context of IT professions? Um, everyone on board so far with what's going on? All right, so if this is what a profession is, and IT is going to be our real focus today, what do you think professional ethics is? Given what we said with ethics, what is it that professional ethics is? Any thoughts? So exactly, it's ethics for a professional, and specifically, F specialized ethics that come up for a certain profession. So yeah. Moral issues in the workplace is another one. So it's basically what professional ethics is, a subfield of ethics that focuses specifically on ethical issues having to do with the workplace and all ethical questions that come up tied in with a particular profession. So for instance, there is such a thing as medical ethics. And what medical ethics does is it covers the specific ethical issues that come up if you are working as a medical professional. So a doctor has to worry about medical ethics. There's also legal ethics. And legal ethics is something that covers the specific ethical questions that come up for lawyers. There's also going to be, there's ethics around um, like professional sports, there's ethics. So for instance, it might not be healthy for me, but if I really wanted to inject myself with steroids every single day, um, most steroids that I would inject myself with are not illegal. It might have long-term effects on my body, but there's nothing wrong with my doing that. By contrast, if I'm a professional athlete and I'm injecting myself with steroids, that is creating an unfair advantage that becomes a moral issue. So does everyone understand here what is meant by professional ethics? Just it's a specialized ethics that looks at the ethical issues that come up in a particular profession. So professional ethics um, validates the integrity of a profession as well. Yes, that's a big part of it. And so what I think is worth talking about, that's actually a really nice transition, is to transition from what professional ethics is to why there's such a thing as professional ethics. Where does it come from? Why do we have it? Because as we talked about a few classes ago, you might think, you know, ethics is ethics. It's simple. You know, if you're, if you know what's right and wrong, you don't need any sort of special ethics for a doctor. You don't need special ethics for a lawyer. It's just, you know, what's right and wrong. And then you go out and do it. However, what has developed is very often certain types of professions have specialized ethical frameworks and ethical systems in place. And so it's not just that medical ethics is slightly different from regular ethics. Legal ethics is slightly different. Athlete ethics is slightly different. And so why is this the case? Why would we want specialized ethics for a profession and what in practice does it look like to have professional ethics in place? So first off, why would you want specialized ethics? Why do we want a specialized branch of ethics that focuses on medicine? Why do we want a specialized branch that focuses on law? Or in this case, why do we want a specialized branch that's focused on IT? What is it generally about these fields that means that we need these specialized ethics? Anyone have any thoughts? They're each unique. Yeah, so that's a big one, is there's uniqueness. And it's uniqueness in terms of, I don't actually know if that's how you spell unique. I think it is. 
I'm terrible at spelling. Uh, so yeah, each profession has different sorts of questions that come up. And while in some sense, they're general sorts of issues that come up elsewhere, like should I cause pain? Should I cause harm? There's also, however, issues that come up in a particular field because that field is unique that is not going to come up for other people. So for instance, um, think about doctors. What are some of the questions that doctors have to face, which the average person doesn't need to be worried about? Yeah, who should get these organs? Or to use like the, the example from the start of COVID, we have one ventilator left and three people who need it. Who should get the ventilator? That is a sort of question that is unique to medicine. You in your everyday life are not going to be deciding who should get some sort of life-saving medical treatment when there's not enough to go around. So medical ethics has issues that come up which aren't going to come up for the average person. And very often, it's not just that these things are unique, it's that they are, what's the best way of putting this? Um, very important. So it's not just that it's the medical questions are unique ones. They're ones with big impact or they're important questions. So for instance, a doctor is going to have to make life and death decisions a lot more often than I am going to have to as a, prof uh, a professor. Or my guess is most of you, unless you're secretly a doctor on the side, in which case, welcome to my class. Um, very rarely are you in going to be in a life or death decision-making situation. However, in a medical context, you might be. Also, the worst that happens in this class is you plagiarize and I give you an F. If, however, you're a lawyer, what's the worst that can happen if you are defending someone? What are some of the problems that can arise? if you aren't doing it well or as to the best of your ability? Um, the case can go like downhill. The jury can like decide like you're lying or you're like not in the right place to represent somebody. So they'll just like plead your client guilty. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the thing, you can end up with an innocent person getting locked up. Or if you're a prosecutor and you don't do your job right, or you cut corners so that you violate the rules of the courtroom, a guilty person can go free. In both of these cases, these are big, very important issues. So a, a reason why there's medical ethics is that, or legal ethics or professional ethics generally, is generally speaking, these are things that have big impacts. And so you want to be extra certain that you're right. So if I, you know, make a bad judgment and decide to lie to my grandma, the worst that happens is she find, and I afterwards I'm like, oh, that's a mistake. The worst that happens is grandma's upset at me and there's probably some family drama, but nobody's dying over it. If I'm a doctor and I make a mistake, people's lives can end. If I'm a lawyer, and mistakes are made, somebody who shouldn't be in jail is, and somebody who should be isn't. These are big, impactful things. What if a lawyer is defending a guilty person? So I think this is a, that's a great like general legal issue, but I think the way to think about lawyers defending guilty people is if you assume that everybody is deserve, no matter what happens, everyone deserves a right to a fair trial because if we don't know beforehand whether somebody actually, excuse me, actually did it or not. So if we knew who was guilty and who was innocent, we wouldn't need a courtroom in the first place. We could just, you know, run a wand over them and it would tell us. But if you go into it assuming that everybody could be innocent, then it's still the responsibility. The lawyer still has to do a good job because we don't know whether that person is innocent or not. So if it turns out that they're guilty, they still deserve a good lawyer because in another universe, they're innocent and we don't want to put them away. Does that make sense? Um, so that's the first thing, very important issues. Here's another big thing though about medical ethics. How many of you in your everyday life think you could identify if I was being too mean to my grandma? 
just watching what I was doing. Like, just like, if you saw me interact with my grandma, just from like a side, you could tell if I was being nice or mean to her. So if I was saying things like, come here, grandma, or fuck you, grandma, like which one could you tell when I'm being nice and when I'm not? Like, hopefully you're all able to, to figure this one out. It's not too difficult. Or, you know, everyday things, you know, you can tell if I kick a puppy, I'm doing something wrong. How many of you though, think if you were sitting there watching a doctor, who is in a hurry to get home because they wanted to watch their favorite show. And therefore, a surgeon, this person's got someone on the table. They're doing surgery and they look at their watch and they think to themselves, oh crap, my favorite TV show's on in a half hour, an hour. I gotta hurry up. And so they hurry up and in the process, they make a mistake during the surgery and somebody ends up having to, um, if we can go with an extreme case, the person dies or say just something else, Say they accidentally put the person, the person gets paralyzed from the waist down and can never walk again. How many of you think you could tell watching the surgery happen? You're not inside the doctor's head and they're not saying like, oh, I got to hurry up. You just see them doing a surgery. How many of you think you could tell whether the doctor was doing a good job or not? Any of you think you could? I mean, like there are certain extreme cases where if like the doctor's taking a hammer and hitting someone over the head, you know, they're doing it wrong. But generally, how many, of, is there anyone who thinks they could tell an actual licensed medical professional whether they're doing a good or bad job? I certainly couldn't. Ali says he can. And I think that's the case. Most of us cannot tell who is doing a good job in a medical context. Who would be able to tell? Who would have the expertise to know whether this person was cutting corners or not? No one in the same field. Exactly, Delon. Exactly, Aguinor. Everyone. Yeah, other doctors. So the other aspect of the uniqueness of medical professionals is because it takes expertise, only another professional can judge quality so and it's the same thing with legal i don't know the rules of what a lawyer is and isn't allowed to say to a client or the other side i know there are certain things that they shouldn't do like if you're defending someone you shouldn't say i hate this guy find him guilty but like that's the extreme case most of the time i don't know the legal procedures the only person who would know is another lawyer so this is the idea behind professional ethics. Professional ethics is this field that's developed because professions are so unique in that they have very important consequences and they're very complicated. So normal everyday ethics isn't good enough to make sure that these people behave well. Instead, you need systems in place to make sure that the uniqueness of the profession is respected so that Everyone within the profession is able to behave in a way that is ethical because the usual ethical standards aren't good enough when not anyone can tell when someone's being bad or good and when the consequences of it going wrong can be very, very high. So the idea here is what professional ethics then is, is these fields of ethics that develop around professions that are designed to make sure that the people in that profession are held to a high enough standard given how much, how big their consequence be, and given that the average person isn't going to be able to tell whether the person in the profession is being a good person or not. All of that makes sense to everyone? Yeah. All right. Okay. So what I want to talk about now is we're going to kind of shift into the IT profession context. And what I actually What's the best way of thinking about this? We're going to be moving towards IT to talk about some of the special worries that come up for IT that don't exist for other professions. And really the reason why that, I'm just going to erase this, it's quicker just to write IT again. And the reason why is because what we're going to do, we're going to talk about what sorts of issues, um, or I guess what, what sorts of ways professions have found to make sure that the professional ethics is followed within their field. And then we're gonna talk about how some of the issues that arise in IT, because a lot of these systems aren't quite in place yet.
and what some of the consequences of that uh, can be. That was a very long-winded way of saying, we're gonna talk about what doctors, what medicine has, what law has, which IT doesn't, and look at the ethical issues that come out of the different approaches to um, professional ethics. Uh, does that make sense, everybody? All right, so let's talk about doctors here. Pro doctors have a special type of ethics in place. They have special rules that doctors have to follow. So for instance, there's a rule that if you are a doctor and someone, and say you're a surgeon in an emergency room and someone comes to get, say it's a gunshot wound and you look at them and you realize they're your terrible neighbor who you absolutely hate. Do you have to perform surgery on them according to the medical ethics guidelines, even yeah. though you hate them? Yeah, you took an oath. Yes. Exactly, there is an oath. You as a doctor, do not get to choose whether or not to do surgery on someone. Even if, so if you were a doctor and somehow Hitler ended up on your table, ethically speaking within the professional ethics, if you refused to do surgery on Hitler, you would be fired and you would not be allowed to be a doctor anymore. So these are the sorts of specialized rules. Now, how is it that these are implemented? What is the, like, the social framework by which the doctoring profession is monitored and kept under control. What is another way of putting this is if you want to be a doctor, what are some of the things you have to do to qualify as someone who is ethically acceptable to be a doctor? Medical school. Medical school. You have to go to a special school, medis school. That says medical school in shorthand. Medical school. That's the first thing. And what do they give you when you finish medical school? Yeah, you get a certification and a degree. If I wanted to perform surgery tomorrow, what would I be allowed to do it? No, I need to get a certification. I need to get an MD. And then it's not just that I get these things. I need to then keep taking these tests every few years so that they don't take away my license. It's the same thing with law. If you graduate law school, that doesn't necessarily mean you're allowed to practice law. You have to pass a big statewide test to be allowed to practice law in that state. You have to pass the bar exam. If you don't pass it, you aren't allowed to be a lawyer yet. So these are the things that are in place. You've got these certification programs in place and you've got degrees required to get those sorts of jobs. And even if, so imagine, that by some miracle, you walked outside one day, you got struck by lightning, and by getting struck by lightning, your brain was rewired so that you know exactly how to do all medicine. Wouldn't matter, like if I were to put you on a, like I were to run you into a surgery room, you'd be able to do it perfectly just because you got zapped on the head with lightning. Would you legally, even if you were like, look, 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 I got hit by lightning, I know how to do surgery now. Would you be allowed to do that surgery? No matter how skilled you are, no, you would not be. So this is one thing that most professions have is they have these certifications and they also have usually degrees tied in with them. What are some other things that exist that prevent people from being behaving unethically in a medical or a legal context? They're kind of related to these certifications. So where does the certification come from? Anyone know? Another way of putting this is when you graduate from college, you get a degree. Where does the degree come from? Like institutions. Exactly. So in your case, if you're a student at John Jay, you get a degree from John Jay. Where do these certifications come from in a medical, school, medical context? Who gives it? Does anyone know? You get the degree from your medical school, but actually it's a level up from that, Muhammad. It's usually the AMA, which is the American Medical Association. And so what it is, is it's this giant governing body that governs all doctors within the United States. So if, no matter what state you're in, no matter what hospital you work at, you need to get improved 
approval from this general governing body. In the same way, I think it with law, it's on a state by state basis. But if you want to practice medicine and say you say you were a doctor, you lived in New York your whole life, and then you moved to London. Well, to become a doctor in London, you need to again pass the the British test, the, the test of the United Kingdom to be allowed to practice law there. And it's because there are these big governing bodies that control it. And who is in these governing bodies? Who's in charge of them? Anyone have any guess what we said before? Who makes these up? Who are the members? Other doctors. Exactly, Pedro. Yeah, so other doctors. So you've got these, you've got certifications, you've got degrees, and you've got governing bodies. And it's not just that these governing bodies are things that will yell at you if you do things wrong. They can literally make it so you are no longer allowed to practice. And if you try to practice without the approval of the governing body, you can go to jail for that. So there are stories of, um, let's see, uh, what, what the hell was his name? Um, how many of you have heard of Dr. Bum Bum? Anyone heard of Dr. Bum Bum? He made it into the news a few years ago. Um, based on his name, Anyone want to guess what type of surgery Dr. Bum Bum specialized in? Plastic? Probably did. Specifically yeah. plastic <laughs> in what form? Not just the whole body. It, I don't, it may sound- Butts. Like, uh, exactly, Tyler. BBOs? Okay, okay. Yeah, BBOs. but Dr. Bum Bum was one of these, yeah. He His was- <laughs> he, Yep, he was a, a uh, he was somebody who, he was a Brazilian doctor who- basically specialized in Brazilian butt lifts. And what turned out is Dr. Bum Bum got his license taken away because he was cutting corners and things. And then he kept doing these Brazilian butt lifts in his living room. He'd have people come and get these. And it led to patients dying because he did not have the, the situation. There was like an international manhunt for Dr. Bum Bum because he was you know, literally killing people and go, by performing that surgery, even if no one had died, it still would have been illegal because of the nature of medicine. There's another thing that governs how you behave in a professional context. So if you are a doctor and you join a hospital, say your first, before you um, join the, the job, what are you gonna have to do? Before you're allowed to start working, you've got your degree, you've got your certification, but say you want to start working at the Mount Sinai that's across the street from John Jay. What do you need to do? So yeah, resume, but say they've already said, yes, we accept you. Yes, you've gotten the job interview. But before you're able to actually start, what else do you have to do? So training is another one. So that's a big one. You need training for that specialized hospital. So that's a good one. And that ties back in with just training in general. But there's a specific thing you get, and it's usually tied in with a certain department in the hospital. And it's not a department tied in with medicine. It's a department that's tied in with two letters. Oh, I should. And the thing you have to provide them with looks like this. So yeah, an oath is one. Or generally speaking, it's just some type of code of conduct. So what do we mean by a code of conduct? You've all signed these in, even if you aren't a professional, we all have to sign these all the time. So John Jay, all of CUNY, all the different CUNY schools have codes of conduct. What is a code of conduct? And it's, it's controlled by the HR department, human resources. And very often it has an oath tied into it. So what is a code of conduct? So think about it this way. When you went to John Jay and you were filling out the, like before your first day, you got this piece of paper and you had to sign at the bottom, like I recognize on this piece of paper that, the well, what did you have to sign? It's not just that you accept your offer. There's other things you had to sign. Anyone know? Yeah, basically it listed all the things that you could and couldn't do as a member of the John Jay community. You couldn't, you had to sign something that said, I accept that there's no bribery and that 
presidents cannot be given to faculty in exchange for grades. I accept that as a student, I'm not allowed to steal other students' work. I accept that I'm not allowed to have any sort of relations of a more than teacher-student variety with any professors. And professors have to sign the same thing. I am not allowed as a professor to engage in any sort of relationship with a student because of yada, all of these things. You're not allowed to use any sort of racially charged language on campus. You aren't allowed to blah, 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 blah. So that's what a code of conduct is. Businesses have them as well. So for instance, there are certain things where, like just to give an example, very often what a code of conduct will say is that certain types of things which might technically be legal are, there's a special consideration in a, um, in a particular context. So for, and this is something we'll come up later in the semester. For instance, legally speaking, as long as you are not using it in the threat, using the n-word is not strictly speaking illegal because of something we'll talk about later in the semester with first amendment rights however if you were to use it on the john jay campus you would be kicked out for making an unsafe learning environment because that is something which will make other students uncomfortable so a code of conduct is something that says given the particular nature of our our community here you cannot do these things even if Strictly speaking, they might be legal in the more general context for better or for worse. Another one is um, there are a lot of states in which you are allowed to carry a concealed firearm. However, on private school campuses, they can outlaw that. So even if the state of Texas says, as long as you have a license, you can carry a firearm concealed wherever you want, at a private school within Texas, they might create specialized rules of, because we are a private institution, you aren't allowed to be carrying your Glock onto campus. So does everyone understand here what this code of conduct is? It's designed to make sure that you are following the sorts of rules that exist in that institution over and above the regular ordinary things that might be put in place by the governing bodies or what you learn through training or what your certification says. It's like additional rules that are handed to you generally by whoever you're working for. So in our case, or whoever you're a student with, anything like that. So does everyone understand what's meant by this notion of a code of conduct? All right. Um, so let me think of the best way how I want to approach this. And so just to highlight with codes of conduct, I'm just going to write down, I think it's worth highlighting these because the book talks about a lot of the important aspects of codes of conduct. And there's, they play an important role in a workplace. And so I'm just going to write down the five things that the book says codes of conduct really are valuable for. Inspire, educate, guide, hold, accountable and last one discipline so what codes of conduct basically allow you to do is you write down in a format that everyone is supposed to read this set of rules that is supposed to tell everyone working for you one what does this company stand for so that you as somebody working there have a sense of identity and know what your company is working for and what values they have, therefore to better understand how you should fit in. It also allows you to learn what is and isn't acceptable. If you come from one company in one place and go to another company that has a very different culture, then like workplace culture, the code of conduct can help educate you about what that is. Also, if you have any particular questions about what is and isn't acceptable in your job. So for instance, one job might have a ruling that says, um, like different jobs have different ways of stating a sexual harassment clause. So it, learning what, how broad your place of work defines sexual harassment is something that you can learn by reading the, the code of conduct, for instance, is telling an off-color joke, does that count as sexual harassment? 
Well, the code of conduct is going to tell you and tell you what you should and shouldn't say in that context and what also you can be punished for if you don't obey. So that's the other thing with the code of conduct. It'll, if you've read this thing and signed it, then the company's able to say, hey, look, we said you weren't allowed to do X and Y. You did X and Y. We now have the right to punish you or discipline you for this. So codes of conduct play an active role, especially in a workplace environment. The medical board allows you to make sure that you have certifications and everything else that you need to practice being a doctor. But then at a lower level, each company, each hospital will have a code of conduct to deal with more practical everyday uh, questions. And these are still very important because they're written by people who are in the field. So even if it's not this overview um, medical board sort of thing, the hospital codes of conduct are still written by other doctors. So if your hospital is serving a specific community or people with a specific need, the code of conduct will reflect that and ensure that everyone knows how to properly behave in that context. All right, everyone on board with this? We all good with these things? Yes. All right, let me take a sip of water. Um, so I've been talking about this stuff in the context of medicine and law. What I wanna do now is draw a big contrast between medicine and law on the one hand and IT professionals on the other. And what I wanna talk about is how the nature of IT as a field that has developed incredibly quickly, incredibly recently, a lot of the systems that are in place for governing the profession that you have in medicine are not in place when it comes to uh, an IT profession. So what do I mean by this? So remember I said, if you are a doctor and if you get struck on the head by lightning and you suddenly become the best surgeon in the world but have never gotten formal training, you would not be allowed to practice medicine. Now imagine another case. You're one day thinking, maybe I wanna go into computer science. All of a sudden you get struck by lightning and you suddenly know every programming language inside and out and have become one of the like best 1% of programmers in the world in terms of your knowledge and your ability to code. Would you be able to get a job the next day in IT? Uh, I mean, it depends. Like IT is just not gonna be like, okay, you know every code, here you're hired. Like they, they gotta know like what you know, where'd you get your education from? How'd you go about it? What codes can you do? What codes can you not do? Are you willing to learn more codes? Like, But say that you get in there and you're like, I know every code. And they're like, um, well, prove it to me. And say that what you do here is you just take 24 hours and make an incredibly effective program. Is that going to be enough to get you the job? Yeah. Yeah, it's it is. You just, and so Tesla does not, this is a good one. Muhammad says Tesla does not require it. You just need to show some experience. And even um, in most cases, you generally speaking, it helps to show that you have an education in computer science. But if somehow you got in front of a company and showed them you could code and they saw how effective you were, even if you're self-taught, you do not necessarily have to have gotten a computer science degree. You could, there are instances of people who become high level programmers who start their own company who never went to college, never finished high school. They did not need to get the equivalent of a medical degree. So, um, so yeah, most engineering jobs don't care about certifications. All they care about is real world knowledge and experience. They'll make you solve an old problem and see how quickly you can do it. So it's much more they practice in context whether you can do the job and whether you have this, like, they... In a medical context, they would never even let you practice or show that you can do the job until you've gone to medical school. It's not like you can go, no, 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 let me prove it to you. Give me a body. Give me a body and I'm going to show you I know what I'm doing. 
That would never happen. You need, before you're even allowed to try to show that you know what you're doing, you need to have these certifications. By contrast, in the context of computer programming, basically, if you can code well enough and can show to somebody else that you can do it, you can get the job. It's difficult if you have no experience to show that, but it's le at least in theory possible to be self-taught and get the job. As long as you get, like, as long as they look at your resume enough that you get an interview and you solve the problem, doesn't matter where you were trained or how you got there. All that matters is you can do it. So does everyone see this fundamental difference here between a computer science uh, sort of job or an IT job, which is much more governed simply by the question of can you do it versus a medical context where it's not just can you do it, it's do you have the certifications? Doesn't matter if you've been practicing medicine for 45 years in the United States. If you move to London, you need to pass a test. Doesn't matter that you can have a great record in the United States. The test has to be passed. Everyone understand that difference here. And it's a difference that matters because also tied in with this, we said these certifications and things come from governing bodies. You get them from the governing body of whether you're allowed to do this. In an IT context, generally speaking, who decides whether you count as qualified for the job? If you apply, if you're looking to get a job at Tesla, who do you have to talk to to get that job at Tesla? Yeah, you got to talk to Tesla HR. By contrast, if you want to get a job at Mount Sinai, you have to talk to two different things. You, one, have to talk to Mount Sinai, but you also have to talk to the American Medical Association. So it's spread out between multiple organizations you have to get approval from. In the context of Tesla, the only people you have to prove that you're worthy of a job at Tesla to are the people who run Tesla. That's the only person you need to impress. Doesn't matter what tests you've taken, what certifications you have, if you impress the people at Tesla, you can get the job. By contrast, you could impress the Mount Sinai people as the best doctor ever. They're going to say, you still need to get your board certification in the United States or in New York. So what we see here, and also another big issue is in a medical school context, if or a medicine context, if you lose your license, you aren't allowed to get a job at another place. You're just not allowed to until you get that license from the board again. By contrast, if Tesla fires you, but you still have a lot of coding experience and they fire you say because you broke their code of conduct, could you get a job at another tech company? In theory, at the very least in theory. Yes. Yeah, you could, at least in theory. By contrast, if you get fired by, because of you violating the certification requirements of the medical board, you can't get a job anywhere else. So what we see here is that in medicine, we have these certifications. We have these degrees you need to have. We have these very strong governing bodies that are tied in legally with the criminal justice system. By contrast, what we see in the context of IT is there are certifications, but there's not, they don't have the power that you have in something like medicine or law. They're much weaker. It's much more just to prove that you have the abilities, not so much anything else. It's not to show that you've taken a study of the ethical side of things. It's much more just, can you get the job done? It really helps to get an interview if you've got a degree in computer science, but you don't need one. It is not mandatory. And while there are these bodies that um, are associated with computer science and information technology, they, aren't, they don't have the governing powers that you'd have with something like the AMA or the New York Bar Association or something like that. They literally have the power to stop you from working anywhere you want. If one, even if there's a company, like these gov the governing bodies that exist in the realm of IT, 
even if they say this person shouldn't be hired, they don't have the power to prevent a company from hiring that person if they're deemed successful. So what we start to see here is in the context of, um, if we go from medicine to IT, what we start to see is that a lot of the systems that are in place for ensuring a professional ethics in other fields are much more lacking in IT. Things that we take for granted for doctors don't exist in the same way for medicine. And there's a simple reason for this, which is basically medicine's been around a lot longer than IT has. And it took a while for medicine to build up these systems in place. It used to be the sort of thing of, if you say you're a doctor, you're a doctor. And if you can get clients, they'll let you do surgery. Um, like, so think about, uh, for much of our history as, as a species, there was this combined job title of barber surgeon. The same person who cut your hair cut all the other stuff. So like clearly you can be a great hair cutter and not be a good surgeon. And for a long time, that's how it was, which is also why people didn't want to go to the doctor for much of our history. It took time for these systems to get in place. But before that happened, it was chaos. And with IT, we are to some degree in the chaotic early stages still, because IT as a profession that is so common and everywhere is something that's really only come into existence since like the 1990s. That was really the first time that IT became a profession as opposed to something people made businesses out of their mom's basement because they found computers interesting. It only became a field recently. And because of that, a lot of the things that we have in place to govern behavior are not there. Does this like general picture make sense to everyone? So what are some of the issues that can come up with this? So if we don't have a governing body, if we don't have these sorts of things to the same degree in IT, where do most of the rules for how to behave in an IT context come from? Where do, like, wh who sets them and where do they come from? The company themselves. So yeah, so they come from codes of conduct and that's generally the only place they come from. And because of this, who writes the code of conduct at the end of the day? Well, generally speaking, it's a company themselves. And so to be clear, Codes of conduct are very, very, and a lot of companies, most companies take them very seriously and ensure that they do provide their employees with a, as good of a set of guidelines as they can. But the fact that IT is governed mainly by codes of conduct leads to some issues. And what are some of the issues that come up which don't necessarily come up for something like medicine or law? So when the main rules are being set by codes of conduct written by the companies, what are some of the problems that can come up? There's no accountability if someone... Yeah, so here's one thing. If you're, say your hospital really about um, whether or not you are not, you are, it's a surgery hospital. Say your hospital, the head of the hospital really doesn't care about whether or not you do surgery on everyone who comes in or you pick and choose. Well, the head of the hospital might not care, but if the governing body found out you were doing that, you'd still get fired. By contrast, who at the end of the day is the only one deciding whether your behavior at the company is acceptable or not? Well, the only person at the company who's acceptable or not, or decides whether your behavior is also within the company. Um, and so Mohammed asked, like a builder who built a bad bridge, do we blame the builder as a software engineer responsible for software malfunction of a cannon in South Africa? It depends on the contract or the code of conduct they signed. So yeah, so what Mohammed is saying is that, and we're gonna come up more with this issue of who do you blame a little bit later in class, but there's this major issue of if there's not a governing body and the company is the one who decides whether what you're doing is acceptable or not, it becomes this big issue of there's no outside accountability for the behavior. And this can lead to issues and conflicts of interest. 
And so what do I mean by conflict of interest? What is a conflict of interest? Anyone, how many of you have heard this phrase before? Just raise your hands if you have. Anybody else? All right, let's work through it then. Well, what's a conflict, generally speaking? What does it mean for two things to conflict or be in a conflict? Uh, they don't agree. They don't have like matching ideas. Exactly. They pull in different directions or they have different ideas. Neither, you have two different sides that instead of working together are pulling in opposite ways and disagreeing. What is it to have an interest in something or to be interested? Well, it's to have certain views on something. Or in, in this particular case, to have, um, what's the best way of putting this? Uh, a conflict of interest is a case in which you have two things that are pulling in opposite directions, two values that are pulling in opposite directions, and you have to pick between the two. So for instance, you can think of a case in which, and these are the sorts of things that happen. So imagine, here would be a case of a conflict of interest. Imagine you've got a company and the CEO is very effective. Since they've become CEO, the company has say, increased in value two times. The stocks have gone up. You make it onto the news all the time. You're very popular. You are each of the people working for you who has stocks has been made wealthier. Anyone who owns stock has been made wealthier because of the CEO's leadership. But then it turns out Turns out the CEO has been sexually harassing someone in the workplace. Why is this a conflict of interest? Well, on the one hand, the CEO is doing something bad for your company. On the other hand, the CEO is doing something good for your company. So if you are an outside source and you see this and you see sexual harassment, your job as say a court would be to decide, I don't care about how much profit you're making as a company. All I care about is the sexual harassment side. You have no conflict of interest from the outside. If, however, you are on the board of directors of this company or you're involved in the company and firing this CEO would cost the company money and this information coming out would hurt the stock price, now you've got this tough decision of do I do what's just here or do I keep doing what is making this company money? That is a conflict of interest. And what we find is when there's no governing body outside and rather the rules are set from inside, conflicts of interest are far, far more likely to come up. And so that's one issue where the only thing governing your company is a code of conduct. You end up with these cases in which companies, the only thing that decides whether somebody's held accountable by a code of conduct is the company themselves. There's no outside source. And what this leads to is if an employee is deemed successful enough from a business standpoint, this person will continue to work even if there's this terrible sort of thing going on. Yeah, Mama says companies become the judge and the jury. That's exactly right. They first judge, they don't just look at uh, the facts and they don't just decide the punishment. They're the ones who first decide, should this person be punished at all? And then they decide how much this person should be punished. And then they do the punishing. But instead of it being entirely from a moral or ethical standpoint, a company cannot help but allow the monetary considerations to come into effect. So what you have, therefore, is in an IT context, a lot more power ends up resting with the company. Yeah, who will guard the guards becomes a big issue. And in a medical context, you've got watchers watching the watchers. You've got the person who's looking to make sure that the individual hospitals are following the rules. In the case of many companies, be it in tech or other sorts of big companies, what very often ends up happening, and especially in tech because it's so new, is there's not really systems in place to guard the guards yet. So does everyone understand that first issue here? And that basically just as a professional in an IT context, 
you are going to be facing ethical questions that are, I, I guess a way of putting this is you have less guidance for any ethical question in the workplace in IT than you would for other fields. And that's just something to know about. Because the fact is, if your company doesn't care what you're doing, you know, unless it gets out, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, as long as the information stays within company and your company's doing unfortunate stuff, there's not really an outside source, legally speaking, to go to in a lot of cases, unless there's a law being broken. Um, any questions on that first issue with it? Yeah, only the, that's exactly right, Nicole. Usually in IT, the only person who decides if somebody's going to be held accountable is the company themselves, which leads to these conflicts of interest. There's no outside sources. And one thing that we're seeing, so just to put this in like current context, one of the things we're currently seeing in the United States today with big tech. So one of the things that is happening when they're bringing Facebook and all these other companies in front of Congress these days, what they're attempting, the reason that this is happening is what the government is beginning to want to do is to build these systems to hold these companies accountable. Because up until this point, the only person that was responsible for deciding what Facebook was going to do with your data was Mark Zuckerberg. The only person who was deciding what Amazon was going to do was Jeff Bezos. And so this was leading to issues and we end up with these ethical problems around things like privacy and stuff like that, because at the end of the day, why was Facebook collecting all your data? Because it made them tons of money. And there was no concern from them and no oversight board about whether this was a privacy issue or not. Um, we'll talk more about that stuff in our privacy unit, but that's the general idea. Yeah, the companies decide whether any employee is to be held accountable. And sometimes things like whether to hold the CEO accountable or not ends up being decided for reasons other than purely ethical reasons because companies at the end of the day have a job to make money. Any other question, questions on this first issue? Another issue with codes of conduct is they're often very vague. So what does it mean for something to be vague? It's not specific yeah. enough? Exactly. It's not specific enough. It's not detailed enough. So for instance, the book gives some examples of codes of conduct that have been suggested by some of these loose, they're not really governing bodies. They're rather organizations that are associated with a lot of tech companies. And yeah, not detailed is another way of putting it. So um, what it, a lot of these codes of conduct say are things like, you have an obligation to uh, be honest, an obligation to help the world. Well, what does it mean to help the world? Different people have different views on what helping the world consists of. And whether a certain behavior by you counts as helping the world is so open to interpretation that this basically doesn't do any guiding or holding accountable. How is it that you know companies will say things like, we want a safe workplace environment? Well, what does that mean? Does that mean there's no insults thrown around? Does that mean there's no criticism of other people? Like to what level? So unlike an American Medical Association set of rules, which are very, very specific, and because they're written down by this organization, there's a lot of history of what different things should mean. And there's also a lot of rules around um, things like how, what does you must engage in surgery mean? Well, we have many years of interpreting that. In a legal context, they're all lawyers who know exactly what every word means and people who have trained in interpreting these things. In a company context, these things can be so vague that they provide no guidance at all in a lot of cases or very limited guidance. Um, all right, any last questions on this with the issue with codes of conduct being the only ones? And to be clear, I don't wanna paint the picture that there are not good companies out there. And I would argue, especially in this year, more and more companies are genuinely concerned about these things. 
like making sure that their companies are following professional ethics and that there is a real push to make sure that people are creating a healthy, safe work environment. However, implicit in this whole structure is the fact that the codes of conduct create, if they're the main rules, no matter how good your intentions are, it can lead to these issues because of things like vagueness, because of conflicts of interest. Also things like who's writing the code of conduct? Well, the company is. And very often people who work in a certain field have similar backgrounds and they might not even, they might even with the best intentions miss certain sorts of considerations in the workplace. People are intrinsically biased in a lot of ways. So that's another issue where even if you have people who genuinely care as much as possible about making the company a safe, good, moral, ethical working environment, it's difficult to do that from the inside on all occasions, just because we're all biased in our own certain ways. All right, everyone understand everything we've been doing thus far. All right, so here's what's going to happen. Uh, oh, Delana, is that a question? I'm just saying yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pause the recording. I'm going to take my three-minute bathroom break, and then I'm going to come back, and we're going to power through the last couple things I want to talk about this class. All right, so I'll be back in like two to three minutes. All right, so just to summarize, the main thing I want to have takeaway is professional ethics are these ethical systems designed to govern particular professions because professions are very unique in that they can have big consequences and it's not easy for the average person to know all the details of them. And in many, ideally, because of this, you'd have a lot of systems in place to make sure that companies working within this profession are able to behave ethically. And this means having outside systems to govern and make sure that what's being done is right. However, in IT context, because it's such a new field, in a lot of cases, there's issues with the only thing governing employee behavior is codes of conduct written by the company themselves which can lead to conflicts of interest, vagueness of what to do, biases in the field that ideally we wouldn't have. And so if you end up in a IT profession, just know that in a lot of cases, you might end up with ethical issues that you wouldn't necessarily have to deal with in a different field. And because the law is going to be changing, things that used to be normal practice might shift. All right. Last questions, comments, concerns on this before I move us on to the next issue. Anything? Okay. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and we are going to transition to, that's why I'm transitioning here. This is a good place to talk about this issue because it comes up in the context of professions, but this is really a more general issue about the world today, but it really does come up a lot in the context of information technology. So, holding. So what is it to hold someone responsible for something? What does that mean? Responsibility in the sense of hold someone responsible. It's kind of a tough idea. Or another way of asking this question is what is a sort of situation in which you would say, I want to hold that person responsible? And what exactly does that mean? As applicable by the law? Yeah, so that's one thing. And what does it mean to hold someone responsible by using the law? What does that actually entail in a general everyday sense? And I, so yeah, so that's a big part of it. It's about putting blame on someone. So holding responsible is tying in with blame, but it can also be with praise. So it can be blame or praise. So if somebody does a really good job, and say you get an A paper, I can hold you responsible for that paper. And it sounds a little weird because we usually use holding responsible in a negative context, 
but I can hold you responsible by telling you that was a hell of a good paper. Or if you show up late for class and insult all your classmates, I can call you afterwards and blame you for that and say you are making an unsafe classroom environment. So what then, so this is what's meant by holding responsible. Why do we, so two different questions. One is in what situation do you hold someone responsible for something? So one is what are the circumstances in which A is responsible for B? And then question two, why hold people responsible at all? Why do we put blame on people? Why do we praise them? And on the flip side, what are the circumstances in which you do praise someone for doing a certain action? or you blame someone for doing a certain action. So just to give an example, um, say I walked in the classroom one day and I said, uh, look, I am, I am so, so very, very sorry that um, Abraham Lincoln, I, I'm so sorry that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Please hold me responsible for it. What, what would you look at me like? Yeah, Agonor, that's exactly the face that is appropriate. What, if I said, I'm so sorry, please hold me responsible for shooting Abe Lincoln, what would you look at me as? What would you say to me? Not your yeah, fault. you'd say I'm a crazy person. Exactly. Why? Why am I crazy? What is it about taking responsibility? Why can't I take responsibility for Abe Lincoln being assassinated? Time, yeah, I wasn't even alive. I, the simplest way of putting this is I didn't cause it to happen. So the first thing that's required for you to be held responsible for something is that you have to be the one that caused it to happen. If I slam the door in your face and I'm the one who pulled it shut, I can be held responsible for that because I'm the one that did it. If it happens halfway around the world with none of my responsibility, no cause at all by me, it would be really weird to punish me for it. This is also why, you know, it's we generally, there's something deeply wrong when one person does something and their whole family gets punished for it because those other family members didn't cause it to happen. It was the one person. So that's the first thing that's tied in with when we hold someone responsible. We hold someone responsible when they cause something to happen. But that's not the only thing that goes into responsibility. So imagine that, um, let me think. So imagine that, uh, I think the best way of framing this. Imagine that you are, your best friend sleeps, they, they crash on your couch. And the next morning, when you both wake up, you go to show them this new, I don't know, what's something new that you've gotten recently that you'd want to show off to your best friend? Anyone got anything? Yeah, your new phone. Say it's your new phone. And your friend takes the phone and looks you right in the eye and just starts smashing it on the counter. They just start smashing it on the counter. Would you hold them responsible for this? Would you blame them? Yeah. Yeah, of, course, of course you would. Now imagine the friend crashed on the couch the night before. And unbeknownst to you, this friend is a sleepwalker. And while sleepwalking, they bumbled around, knocked your phone on the ground, and accidentally stepped on it, cracking it, and you need to get a new phone. Would you hold them as responsible and blame them as much in that case as in the case in which they looked you in the eye and smashed it? No, no not as much. Why not? What's the difference here? In both cases, they caused the damage. But what's the big difference? Go on. Oh, the difference is he was sleepwalking during the other time and the other time he deliberately did it. Exactly. That's it's about intention. It's about deliberate intention versus 
or intentional slash deliberate. So if you do something by accident, it seems like it's not as bad as when you do it on purpose. Ah, uh, so that's a big thing. So when it comes to uh, the holding people responsible, it's about what you're intending to do and also whether you actually caused it to happen. Now, there is another element tied in with this, which is, think for a second about uh, drunk driving. Why is it that drunk driving is illegal? Is it that when someone gets behind a, dr a wheel drunk, they are actively trying to kill people? No, nobody, unless they're a true serial killer, no one who's ever driven drunk did it with the intention of killing anybody. But why do we, if a drunk driver hits someone, why do we still hold them responsible? Why is it that you can still get punished for drunk driving? And we generally think you should still get punished for drunk driving, even if you weren't trying to hurt someone. What's going on in the drunk driving case? You're being negligent. Oh, you can speak. Sorry. No, it's like, I, you're being you're being negligent if you do something like that. Yeah, that's a big one. Delon, did you want to follow up? I was just saying they were knowingly intoxicated and still went behind the wheel. Exactly. It's that they knew the risk. So it's not just that you punish people when they do it intentionally. It's even if they intend to do something risky. So it's not just that you have to intend to do something. It's rather that if you intend to do something, knowing that there's an implicit risk in it that can cause harm. So the worst case is a case in which like, if you commit first degree murder, what you have done is you cause someone to die and you intentionally planned the whole thing and you did it step by step and you're going to go to jail for life. If you get behind a wheel drunk and you run someone over, you are still punished and you are still punished quite heavily, but it is slightly different. It's usually not punished as harshly because you weren't intending to kill someone. That was the result, but you were still intending to do something that was risky. You still intentionally chose to engage in a behavior that could cause harm. So, those are so the circumstances in which you hold someone responsible is when they cause something to happen and they either intended it to happen or they did something intentionally that had a high risk of causing something else to happen. So that's really what the circumstances are in which you hold someone responsible. Now, why is it that we hold people responsible? And there's a few different answers here. Why is it that we blame people for things? What does that do for us? Why don't we just go, eh, you know, drunk driving, it happens, children die, you know, it just happens. Why isn't that our response? Why is there something more? Without so accountability. Closure slash justice, I think is a big one. There's a sense in which if somebody has done something and we don't punish them for it, there's just some primal feeling of that's wrong. Also for accountability, and what do you mean by accountability here? I don't know. You're, you're spot on. I just wanna see if you can pull that out a little bit. And don't worry if you can. I'm trying here. Um, yeah, it really just means like who to blame or who to praise. Yeah, so, and why do we want to blame someone? What is it that we get when we blame that person? Because it definitely, we, it gives us, um, Something tangible, I think you can point to. So this is tied in with the closure, the justice, the um, tangibility of like equal something. So it's like the idea is part of the reason is if you did something wrong, you want some feeling. Like if you never learned who killed your loved one, you have nothing tangible to go on. It's something is just out there that you're just left kind of empty. So I think that's a big things issue. Things will happen it. more. Yeah, that's the other big one. Thank you, Pedro. It's to stop it from happening again. That's the other main reason that we want to do this. Either 
And it can happen either one, you wanna stop a particular person from doing it again. So for instance, drunk drivers very often have their license taken away for the simple reason of, if you can't drive, you can't get behind a wheel drunk. Like that is a simple straightforward, but it's also to discourage other people from doing it. If you know that the punishment for stealing is jail time, then even if stealing is something easy that you feel inclined to do, you might be less likely to do it. So it's to discourage people from doing it in the future. So those are the main things. And we do these things, so basically to prevent bad stuff from happening down the line. We basically want to hold people responsible because we want to make sure that there's equality in the world. If something bad happens, you want to be able to say, I know why it happened. Uh, something has been done to even the scales or make it okay. And also something has been done so that this won't happen to me or anybody else in the future. And we do that by basically whenever someone causes something to happen and that what they did was intentional or led to something that could be intentionally risky, we hold them responsible. So that's the general background idea. All right. Why am I bringing this up in a context of computer science? Why am I bringing this up in the context of professional responsibility? Well, there's a rather straightforward reason for it. And I want to bring up this difference here with a little imaginary case. Um, imagine we're in class next Friday. And one of you just walks up to me with a knife and stabs me in the heart. I don't know why you've done it, but you've stabbed me in the heart. Would we hold you responsible and charge you with first degree murder? You did it intentionally. You wanted to do it. I bleed out. I die. Yeah, you're going to, you, of course you're going to do it. Now imagine a slightly separate case. Imagine each one of you thought it would be really funny to give me a paper cut. You weren't talking to each other. You just individually thought, wouldn't it be funny to give the professor a paper cut? And I'm so busy up there lecturing, I don't notice any of you come up behind me. And every one of you gives me a little paper cut. All of you, it's mildly mean, but every one of you thinks it's you know kind of funny. Only unbeknownst to you, none of you knew the other one was going to, anyone else was going to give me a paper cut. So you just thought you were giving me one paper cut. But by the end of class, I have 35 paper cuts. And because, say, I have something that prevents my blood from clotting, I bleed out and die. I am now dead from these 35 independently given paper cuts. First case. Somebody breaks through my skin, I bleed out and die. Second case, somebody bleeds, breaks through my skin, I bleed out and I die. This case, someone clearly, one person should get punished. But what the heck do we do in this case? What do we say? On the one hand, nobody intended for me to die. Like that's very clear. You intended to give me a paper cut, but you didn't intend for me to get, die. And also, there's no way in which you could think, like it's mean to give someone a paper cut, but um, each, and here's the key, no one paper cut killed me. No one paper cut could have murdered me. It's only that each of you together gave me a paper cut. So it's not the last person because it, the last person's alone didn't kill me all of them together did. And we can't even say which was the final killer paper cut. So what do we say here? Are all of you guilty of murder? Are none of you guilty of murder? Are you just guilty of mild assault and a bad joke? Should you, this person should probably, quite possibly go to jail for life. Is somebody who saw this happening and didn't bring it up, are they responsible? How responsible should you be held? And to what degree should you be responsible? Or what about a case to make things even worse? What if, um, what if none of you even tried to do this? All of you were just in a hurry to get to your next class and all of you independently for some reason 
uh, in the process of grabbing your papers, they flew and scraped me in the neck completely by accident. Like, what, what do we do here? What if, um, and, and so do you begin to see that the more people that get involved and the less intentional it is, the harder it is to decide who's responsible and how they should be punished. Do you see how this is just like, in this case, it's very clear. In this case, I certainly don't know what the right punishment is. I don't have a clear judgment of whether, like all of you have done something very slightly wrong. And yet you clearly don't belong in jail for life for giving me a paper cut. Like that's overkill. And yet your paper cuts caused me to die in some extreme sense, but also no one paper cut did. Now, why am I bringing this up in this context? And I think, I think it was Muhammad who brought up a related case up above. Was it you, Muhammad, who brought up the um, weapon system in South Africa? Yeah, so why then am I bringing it up in this context? What is it that I, why am I mentioning this weird paper cutting case? What is the connection to, to tech? How many of you have worked on a group project? Oh, Agnar. I was going to say, it seems like you're painting the picture of like a software development environment where you have a bunch of software engineers programming something. And when it malfunctions, we don't know who to blame. Exactly. That's exactly the context I'm thinking of. How many of you have worked on a group project in a computer science class? If the program doesn't run right, is it always easy to identify who made the mistake? Because each of you are doing some of the code. And not only that, each of you is, it's not like either of you is trying to make a mistake, but mistakes might get made. And so there are actual cases in which these sorts of things have happened. So there was a case um, of, uh, there was a missile, I'm not sure if it was the South African missile, there was some missile system that misfired and shot down a plane. And there was another case in which there was a, um, there was a radiation treatment machine in a hospital. And do people know what radiation treatment machines are used for? Anyone? When would you go into a hospital to be radiated, Pedro? Cancer. Yeah, cancer, exactly. So these things are designed to kill cancerous cells. And so what happened was this thing, I can't remember the exact numbers, but let's say it was supposed to give you one unit of X-ray to zap or whatever N-ray or whatever type of ray they use. Well, there was a mistake made in the programming and it was something like 10,000 were released. What do you think happened to these people who went to get cancer therapy and got 10 times, 10,000 times as much as they were planning on? Yeah, they got micro, yeah, these people died. So seven people died. The question was who is responsible? And when they actually looked at the code, they found multiple independent bugs, just like in the paper cut case, in which no one bug caused the malfunction. Rather, the bugs together caused the malfunction. And not only that, no one knew who had done which code lines exactly because it had all gone through quality control and different people worked on different things. So what ended up happening was just this big, I can't draw emojis, but this was the basic response by the end. No one knew what to do about it because you couldn't really punish any of the individual engineers because they were doing their best. Those of you who have coded, how many of you have ever, how many of you think you could code 10,000 lines without making a single mistake? Yeah, it's humanly impossible. Yeah, it's not gonna happen. So. It's just part of the nature of coding and computer science that these things happen. However, on the flip side, and so it looks like what we want to do is look at the case and say, if somebody died simply because of the nature of the field as something that has mistakes, you can say something like, oh, well, that's an unfortunate consequence. But think over here. They, did they intend to do something risky? And this is where it begins to become messy 
Because to somebody outside, how can you identify whether the company was doing something risky or not? If you find out that they, like how do you judge risk in computer systems? How do you decide whether this company that made the mistake was doing their due diligence or not? How can you tell from the outside if a cybersecurity system is safe enough? What counts as safe enough? At what point do you want to blame the company? And at what point do you just hold your hands up? And this is leading to major issues because we don't know if you are the one who's, if your loved one was this poor person who died from the cancer machine, it's very unsatisfying to be told that's how computers work. Like that is not what you want to hear. You want somebody to get punished. But how can you decide what the correct punishment is? Who would you even hold responsible? And so this is really what the issue is that comes up in the context of computer science more so than ever before. Because starting in around the year, you know, 1750, 1800, we started with the Industrial Revolution having many people working on the same objects. So it used to be the case that if you had a chair, that chair was made by one guy who was a chair maker. So if it broke, you knew exactly who to blame. But if it's getting made in a factory, who do you blame? Well, you know you blame that company and that factory, but who do you blame within the factory? But these days, remember the other year when those Samsung phones were blowing up in people's pockets? Like, who do you blame for that? The battery was made in one place, the, compute, the design was built in another place, the machinery was assembled in a third place and it was being designed and sold in a fourth place. How on earth do you sort this out? And so this is the next ethical thing in the context of professional ethics is as computer science as a field gets more and more and more and more complicated, our traditional ways of holding people accountable it becomes very, very difficult. So yeah, the company with a lawsuit will usually be held accountable. But part of the reason that this comes up is what, what does the correct punishment even look like? What does it look like to punish this company? So we have a few different, what are some of the options? Like imagine over here, this company that made this mistake, what are some of the possible punishments you might give them? One is money. And who's the money coming from though? Who is it coming away from? Are you finding the company or the people who work there or what? So there's money, but there's a question of how do you do the money? Is it company money? Is it a company fine? Is it a individuals be fine? Individuals get fined. What do you do? Company. Yeah, so it seems like you might want to find the company, but here's another issue is what is the appropriate amount to find a company for this sort of mistake? So to go with a, a practical case, um, I guess this was like credit card numbers are always getting stolen um, in large numbers. So say uh, there's a hack in which 300, so let's go, um, and we'll talk about this one later in the semester. Target was hacked one year in which basically they didn't have a very secure um, network and somebody installed a bunch of card readers into their card reader machines on Black Friday and stole something like 300 million credit card numbers worldwide. What is the correct amount to fine a company like Target? Do you want to try to cripple them as a company? in which case all the people who work there will quite possibly lose their jobs. The company themselves will also then have to downsize and people who rely on the target now can't go there anymore. Or do you just give them a little fine that's such a slap on that wrist that they don't even give a damn about it? Because you find them say $10 million, that can sound like a lot of money, until you realize that Target is worth $50 billion. And then you're like, well, that is, the, the relationship between 10 million and 50 billion would be if I, if someone find me 10 bucks, I'd be like, all right, fine, here's your 10 bucks. 
But on the other hand, you want to take away half their money? Well, it seems difficult to do that because it's such a big organization. Another worry about it is in the context of software technology, imagine that, um, what are some other things other than just finding the company? What can you do other than finding? You could boycott is another thing you could do. But what, how can you organize a boycott? A boycott by definition is generally the average person chooses not to go there. So that's not really an institutionalized punishment. It's rather just people by word of mouth decide that blank is no longer worth going to. So that's another option, but it's very hard to uh, like govern a boycott. What are other ways a company might be punished? Yeah, you could fire people, but then we get back to the issue of who do you fire if we don't know who made the problem? So that also doesn't seem to work well. You could also just dissolve the company entirely, but that leads to this same issue as before with individuals who are in no way responsible getting punished. And this just also, if every tech company that something went wrong was dissolved and all their assets were taken away, nobody would go into tech because it would be so risky. Like no one would try, if you, if Tesla learned that the self-driving car was, if anyone was killed, they were going to be shut down as a company and all of their assets were given to the government. Elon Musk never would have gone into trying to build self-driving cars. Now, maybe that's a good thing because maybe you hate self-driving cars and don't trust them just like I do. I don't trust them yet. They're scary to me. I don't like robots, um, except for Roombas. I really like Roombas. I have a really hard, everyone know what I mean by Roomba, the little, little vacuum cleaner. I have a really hard time not trying to carry on conversations with them. They just seem alive to me. And so I often find myself talking to them. They don't say much back is the only issue. But um, most of these things, if you dissolved a big company, you lose out on lots of other companies. If you punish, if a company who lost your credit card information was just completely dissolved, no companies would accept credit cards anymore. And you might, you have to decide, well, how do you punish this? So the real issue here is because of how integrated all of these modern pieces of technology are, it's very difficult to come up with general rules of how to punish them. And even then, how to punish a company in a way that doesn't end up hurting innocence as well. If you fire the CEO, and because the CEO gets fired, half the employees have to go to make up for the fine, does that end up making the world better or worse? Does everyone, so does everyone, well, and I don't have any answers on this one. I just really want to highlight how complicated these things get and how much the professional ethics tied in with computer science makes them even more problematic. Any questions on this or comments or thoughts on either how to avoid these issues or what can be done or these sorts of things? I do think that one thing we're finding more and more though, and just like something that's worth talking about in the context of Facebook. Yeah, there are so many pieces involved as Tyler says, yeah. And one thing that we're finding though, is that um, one of the issues that really came up is that assessing risk was really difficult to define. And very often risk was defined monetarily in these sorts of cases. And what we're starting to see is that at the very least, there has been a shift in the past few years, thanks to privacy issues, in which there has been an attempt to redefine what counts as risk in the context of a company. And companies are beginning to be held accountable for things that they weren't before. Um, they are beginning to be held responsible for things like violating your privacy. And the expectation is that they will not do so, which is leading to these major issues. Um, the last thing I want to talk about then is one of the other things. So there was this talk about boycott there for a second. And so what I want to talk about now is, um, and this will probably come up again later on in the semester. But what I want to talk about is how 
Actually, no. Let's save this for our discussion of um, when we get to regulation, because I want to talk about this is something that, you know, wasn't in the textbook until very recently, or if at all. This wasn't something that the textbook should have talked about until very recently, but it is now something that we cannot help but discuss. And so I want at some point in the semester to talk about cancel culture and really the ways in which it has come to be and what the ethics both for good and bad of it are. But I think we're gonna save that for the regulation class because, um, so it won't come up to later, but what we find is, um, one thing that is happening is when people are dissatisfied with the punishments that are coming through, one of the things that ends up happening to replace this is that cancel culture sets in and boycotts set in. And this leads to many good results and many bad results at the same time. And different cases need to be talked about to just talk about how because there's no system in place and because this is so hard, what ends and we're in a social social media age, social media world, what ends up happening is people who are left frustrated by what does or doesn't get done when somebody dies and no one gets punished and people are left feeling that sense of wanting closure, cancel culture will step in for better and for worse. So we'll talk about that more, but I just want to kind of highlight where we're going to be going later in the semester with cancel culture. Um, any questions on any of this stuff so far? We all good? How are y'all holding up? We doing all right? You still, still yeah, with me? We're good. Yeah, right. we're good. good. All right. So I want to finish off with just a quick discussion of the last topic I wanted to get to, um, which is And this whistleblowing is a topic that comes up again in tech more so than other areas because of the fact that it's less um, governed by institutions like the AMA or the board, the New York Board Association and those sorts of things. So first off, what is whistleblowing? And I don't mean it in the sense of like literally you take a, like not like what a wrestle referee does in a sporting event. I mean in the sense of in a environment in a uh, employment context. Does anyone know what whistleblowing is defined as? So here's, here's the way to think. I'll just put down the definition of what whistleblowing is. The yeah, uh, whistleblowing can be very not fun. So uh, if I tell you that probably the most famous whistleblower in the past uh, 25 years is Edward Snowden. Do people know a bit more about what whistleblowing is? Yeah, it's about spilling secrets, but it's not just the definition of spilling secrets. Like if I, if I find out secretly who somebody's dating and I whisper it to a friend, that doesn't count as whistleblowing. So what is it that counts as whistleblowing? Or if you hear there's a whistleblower at Facebook, what does that mean? And there is a case right now with a whistleblower at Facebook. What is it to be a whistleblower? What sorts of secrets? Yeah. So the idea is you are exposing companies mis misconduct. And so basically what a whistleblower is, is it somebody who goes public with what is happening inside the company? Yeah, you expose what is happening inside the company, usually to, well, by definition to someone outside the company. And very often it's to someone who matters, be it the press, so if I find out something fishy is happening at, say I worked for Google and I don't like what Google's doing and I think it's somewhat problematic, if I go and talk to the New York Times, that's whistleblowing. If I go and talk to politicians and say, this is what's happening on the inside, I think we need new laws, that's whistleblowing. If, however, I'm doing something in my company and say, say I'm working at this company who's building the, uh, the, um, radio, the radiology machine. And I look at this behavior and I look and go, you know, I'm not so sure everyone's working as hard as they can. So instead of going outside, I talk to my boss and I go, hey boss, I think, um, I think Arthur over there in quality assurance isn't doing his job right. That doesn't count as whistleblowing. Whistleblowing only counts if I go over here and talk to a reporter about it. 
or I go over here and talk to a politician about it. That's whistleblowing. So why is whistleblowing an ethical issue? Why is it something that we're talking about in this class? And why is it something worth thinking about in this class? <laughs> yeah, so one thing to know is very often whistleblowing goes against a code of conduct that you've signed because a company might write a code of conduct in such a way that whistleblowing violates it. So you've got this issue of, should I do something which could get me fired? And by the letter of the law is not allowed at this, or by the, by the code of conduct not allowed in order to stand up for something bigger. And this is why whistleblowing becomes this ethical issue because it's very hard to judge whether something is right or wrong in these sorts of cases. And very often, the reason why it comes up is when the main thing governing a company's behavior is a code of conduct, it becomes very difficult to uh, stay within the company and not go outside of it. And the other thing with whistleblowing that's tough is like it becomes an ethical issue because there's the practical component of a company doesn't want you to blow the whistle generally. It affects their bottom line because it puts them in a bad light. So there's a real ethical issue as the whistleblower of should you do this thing. There's also a major issue from the outside of how should you feel about someone who's a whistleblower. Well, I mean, the Snowden stuff has died down because of time, but at the time, whether he was a, the conversation wasn't like, is Edward Snowden a really good guy or kind of a good guy? The debate was, is Edward Snowden a hero or is Edward Snowden a traitor? And that's the level with whistleblowing in which these sorts of things come up. Um, any other, so I guess a, a general question is, when do you think you should whistleblow? What are the contexts? And the book talks about one, but the short answer is there isn't a good one, a good one answer. But what sorts of things do you think you should take into account? Imagine your company was doing something that you deemed unsafe or unhealthy. What would be the level it would have to reach for you to feel comfortable saying something? I think if safety is being like put in jeopardy. So safety, I think, is a big one. What else? There was somebody else who said something. Yeah, I was saying that I think that if you feel like you shouldn't work at that company, you're more likely to quit or resign and that you would have to follow the code of conduct so you can whistle blow or whatever. Yeah. And I think there, there's a big issue here with um, having to decide. And this is the tough thing. Like we can all look at someone who does the honorable thing, but most, many of the people who whistle blow have their lives ruined. Like, so you really have to ask yourself, what are you able to do? And I do think though, like, there is a certain case though, where you have to ask yourself if people's lives are on the line, does me losing my livelihood make it worthwhile? So, I mean, there was, to, to give an example of whistleblowing that happened this week, um, there was a, something whistleblowing-esque in the NFL this week. Anyone know what it was? Anyone who's a National Football League fan? Or sports fan at all, or? reading about it. So basically what happened this week was there was a former coach who's African, uh, I think it's Latino, African-American, um, Black Latino, who basically is suing the NFL for uh, racial discrimination. And this man's career as an NFL coach is probably over because no owner is going to want to hire the guy who sued them. But his thought was like, this is bigger than me, and I'm willing to give up my dream for this other thing. And so you can look at these sorts of cases, and you just really have to assess, how, where are you? How does it fit in? But I think safety is a big one. Another thing worth highlighting with whistleblowing is if it's the sort of thing that you can talk to your boss about, talk to your boss about it. I know it's uncomfortable to talk to a boss about something upsetting, but it's a lot better to talk to a boss than not talk to anyone. The only time 
to not talk to the boss is if you think the very act of talking to them might get you fired. Also, the other good thing, if you end up in, end up in a situation in which you have to whistleblow, um, what's the best way of putting this? Uh, keep your receipts. Basically, the, with whistleblowing, the more of a uh, paper trail you have to prove that something bad is happening, the better off you will be because a company is not allowed to punish somebody who's a whistleblower officially. So if you can prove there's retaliation or something against you, then you are able to whistleblow and not have to worry about your career in the same way. Although there's still gonna be worries about this. Um, does anyone else have anything they wanna say about whistleblowing on this front? And what I wanna finish off with is talking about why whistleblowing is practically speaking so difficult in a lot of cases and just highlight the existence of these things. Um, so I wanna finish off by discussing NDAs. And this is more, this isn't really an ethical issue. I mean, it ties in with ethical issues, but this is more just a practical thing to know about as you get jobs at companies. What is an NDA? Anyone know? Non-disclosure agreement. What is a non-disclosure agreement? It's basically an agreement that you like are not allowed to disclose with any other person, but the people you disclose the information with. Exactly. It's basically a thing that you have to sign when it's very often in the code of conduct that says, I will not talk about anything that's happening at this company outside of the company. And you can obviously see why a company would want this. If you are Apple and you're working on like, or say you're, you're Google and you decide that you want to take over the, um, so you want to say develop, well, actually, let me think about it. Say you're Apple and you want to get into the self-driving car game and you've discovered something that's going to make your self-driving car way better than Tesla or Google's. If you start talking about it at parties, is Apple going to be happy about that? If you're talking about all the secrets of this new self-driving car and all, to all your friends at the parties, no. Why aren't they going to be happy? Why doesn't Apple want you talking about the self-driving car that you're designing at parties? So one is they want to talk about it, but say you're describing the machinery exactly. Someone might steal the ideas. If you're at a party with a Google employee, then they might take that and go back to Google and that will hurt the company. So very often there are these non-disclosure agreements to prevent against that. However, the worry with non-disclosure agreements is very often they'll in, they can stop you from people from talking about things on the inside or whistleblowing without going against the code of conduct. So very, be aware whenever you get, and if there's one takeaway from today's class, whenever you get a new job, as boring and long as it is, read the code of conduct you get. See if you're signing an NDA. Also, very often companies today will have things like a social media clause in your contract. It will say something like, I, um, I agree not to say anything disparaging about the company in a social media context. If you go on your Instagram and are shitting all over your employer in your Instagram live and someone finds out, there are cases in which that can be a fireable offense. So just know about these things when you go in and read your code of conduct. All right, I'm completely out of gas and I'm having a little trouble breathing at this point. So I'm ending class early. It's harder when it's online because I feel like there's less of a back and forth so I have less time to breathe. Um, although not wearing a mask was nice. Um, does anyone have any questions about what we talked about today at all? Anyone? Are we all good? Good, good, good. All right, pop quiz, when do I see you next? Next Friday. Next Friday, exactly. Uh, which I think we said was the 18th. Uh, pop quiz, where are we meeting? In person. In, class. in person, back in our classroom. Yep, same classroom we've been in, at school. Um, 
All right. In that case, I'm, if nobody has any questions, everyone's good. I'm going to tell you all have a great Tuesday. It's very weird saying have a great Tuesday instead of have a great weekend, but have a great Tuesday. And I will see you all in 10 days. If you have any questions about this class or anything else, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and this class, I'm stopping the recording right now.